Good evening, church. It's always good to worship God with each and every one of you this evening. You know, the way we celebrate Christmas might be just a hair different this year, but the reason that we celebrate will never change, and that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you'd stand for me for the call to worship. Which it comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 in unison, which says, For today in, in the city, city of, of David, David there has been born, born for you a Savior, who is, who is Christ, Christ the Lord. Lord. This, this will be a sign for you. You will find, find a baby, baby wrapped, wrapped in clothes and, clothes and laying in a manger. Uh, we're going to sing hymn number 125, Joy to the World. go to the Lord this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, Lord. We thank you that we can just come in your house and worship you. We thank you that you sent your son in the form of a baby, Lord, that he would be our savior in this world. We just ask that everything we do here is pleasing to you this evening, Lord. We ask your blessings upon Pastor Lee and the message that you've laid on his heart, and the congregation, that we can hear that message in the way that you want us to hear it. We just ask that you be with the special music tonight lord each and every person here and be with the people that couldn't be here this evening lord whether they're in the hospital or wherever they might be worshiping in their homes just special blessing on them just wrap your arms around them lord and let them know that you love them and we just we also want to ask a special blessing on the peterson family tonight lord as they lost their son brandon uh, in a tragic accident we just ask that you comfort them, Lord, as they grieve. Just There's a lot of people in the community hurting tonight, Lord, and we just ask that you wrap your loving arms around them the way that only a Savior can. All these things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. amen. Lighting of the Advent wreath with Pastor Lee and Sue. You may be seated. We've come to the fifth, the fifth candle. The first candle we lit was a candle of hope. Hope in the Bible is secured in a trusted place, in a trustworthy God. God has never failed us. The second week, we lit the candle of peace, that we have a testimony to tell the world around us about the relationship that we have in Jesus Christ. The third candle was joy. 
Joy is a special emotion from the Holy Spirit. It hinges on the relationship that we have in Jesus Christ. The fourth is love. We are to remember, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. The Christ candle is the fifth and the last candle. White is the advent color, representing purity, light, and godliness. It is also a symbol of victory. This candle is to remind Christians of the light of Jesus brings to us. He is the light that came into this darkened and dying world. This candle is in the center, just as Jesus is the center of Christmas as we celebrate it. He is a true reason for hope, for peace, for joy, and love. As we light the Christ candle, celebrating the end of Advent and the arrival of Christmas and Christ, let us remember how our Savior came once as a lowly baby, and through him we might be saved. In John chapter 8, verse 12, it states this, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. In darkness, it says. But will have the light of life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. You sent your son Jesus into the dark world to die for our sins. His light is a gift of God to all who put their trust in him. Father, may our light shine And may our lights illuminate this darkened world that we live in. Just bless us and be with us as we continue this evening during this Christmas season. And we ask it in your precious name. We now light the fifth candle, the Christ candle. going to sing hymn number 132, Angels We Have Heard on High.
There's a story more important than any other. Any other you can imagine or speak or write about. It goes like this. Before man took his first breath of oxygen, God already knew that mankind would one day need rescuing. Sin would enter the human race and cause a break in a relationship with the Heavenly Father. As a result, all people would die and experience, experience eternal apart from Him. But the mystery of divine wisdom, the Bible says that before before the foundation of the world, in 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 20, it says, For he was, for he, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but his appearance in those last times for the sake of you. A plan for our redemption was already in place. God would reach down into the darkness of humanity's sin and redeem us as children of light. The plan was devised. And it was executed and has been revealed through the ages and testifies to the scriptures. From Genesis to Revelation, that is the fullness of time. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, will be born to the Virgin Mary and become a sacrifice for all humanity. Defeating sin and defeating death. By this alone, he will restore our relationship with the Father. If you've never heard this story before, it's what Christmas. It's what Christmas is all about. But if it is familiar, you might be, you might be like many other people who no longer realize, who no longer realize just how powerful this really is. Whatever the case, as we walk together and as we walk through each detail of Jesus' birth story, we will observe the Father's wisdom. My prayer is this. My prayer is that we come to realize just how great, how great and mighty is our God. There's a recipe, like if you have a recipe in your house, all the ingredients, the right, the right ingredients have to go in in order to make whatever you're making proper. The first ingredients that God provided is time, the timing. Look back in history. We might, we might wonder what determines the fullness of time. You know, in Galatians, in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, Born of, born, born of a woman under the law. And verse 5 says, So that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. As sons. Why did, why did God arrange to accomplish this redemptive purpose? By sending his son to earth as a baby then. Throughout their ages, some amazing civilizations and kingdoms developed. But God pointed the time for the arrival of the Messiah that he came during the Roman Empire. Although we, we don't know all the reasons for his choice of this era of time, we do know, we do know that there was a time when he was expected in the Jewish community. They probably didn't expect their Messiah to come as a helpless baby. But they were looking for him just the same. The word records that a righteous and devote, devoted man named Simeon had been told by the Holy Spirit that he would, would not die until he saw the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything was in place. And the world was ready for a Savior. But not only was the timing, there's a place. The place is the next ingredients. Hundreds of years before Jesus' birth, the prophet Micah foretold that a war in Israel from the days of eternity would come from Bethlehem. And because of this prophecy, we know that the Messiah had to be born there. But why did God, why did God choose a small, insignificant town 
From a human perspective, it would make more sense for a king to be born in the capital of Jerusalem rather than a small rural village. A clue is found in the meaning, in the meaning of its name, Bethlehem. In John chapter 6, in John chapter 6 and verse 51, it says, I am the living bread that comes down out of heaven. And if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also, which I have given for the life of the world, is my flesh. Bethlehem means the house of bread. How appropriate. How appropriate the one who claimed to be the living bread would come down out of heaven and was born in the house of bread. You know, the Lord not only chose the place, he wisely, he also wisely orchestrated the events to bring about the fulfillment of his word. Although Caesar Augustus thought that he was the one making the decisions for the Roman emperor, God simply used him to proclaim a taxation decree that would draw Joseph and Mary from Nazareth to Bethlehem just in time for her to give birth to the Son of God in a pre ordained place. Uh, we're going to sing hymn number 134, Emmanuel. Miss Zoe Nutter is going to bless us with the ministry of music. Did you know that your baby boy would someday walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would calm a storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has watched where angels drive. And when you kiss your little baby, you've kissed the face of God. Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know? 
With the ingredients, we saw two ingredients so far. God picked the time and the place. But there's another ingredient that goes into the birth of our Savior, and it's the setting. If you have been in charge, think about it for a minute. If you have been in charge in determining the setting for Jesus' birth, what environment would you have chosen? A place with servants ready to meet every need? Or perhaps a private room? in someone's home, with a midwife to assist in the delivery. At the very least, you, wouldn't, you, would have, you probably would have gave Mary and Joseph a shelter of a clean room in an inn. More than likely, you would not have charred, you would not have taken and chosen a stable filled with odors and sounds of animals. Yet that's exactly what God did. That's exactly what God did and arranged for his beloved son. Again, the question is, why? You know, a manger scene is a nice setting for a Christmas pageant. But the reality of a dirty, smelly stable seems unfit. Unfit for the son of God. Yet, yet even this location displays something. It displays the Lord's wisdom. The major scene is an illustration of, of the role Jesus came to fulfill. In John chapter 1, in the 29th verse, it says, The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Who takes away the sins of the world was born among the, among the livestock of that stable. Took on the role as a Savior. But the next ingredients that we have to look at is the announcement of Jesus' birth. It was the most extraordinary announcement of any, any birth upon the face of the earth or the universe. After Christ was born, the Heavenly Father, the Heavenly Father sent a birth announcement. Now the most logic plan would have been to let the religious leaders and the politicians, the leaders in Jerusalem, know that the Messiah had come. Yet... That's not what God did. Instead, he sent an angel to a group of, of shepherds out in the field, outside of Bethlehem. Why should such, such life-changing news be shared with those who had no influence in the world, who had no, no prestige within the world? But consider how fitting it is, how fitting it is for a shepherd to first hear about the Good Shepherd. For in John chapter 10, verse 11, it says this, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. What an appropriate place to announce the birth of our Savior to lonely shepherds. 
but there's also an ingredient of a name. And God's wisdom, God's wisdom is also in the name he chose for his son. Before Christ's birth, an angel told Joseph to call him Jesus. Now, Jesus was a common name in the nation of Israel at that time. The Hebrew translation really means Joshua, what well, means Jehovah Deliverer. To call the baby Jesus clearly states the purpose for which he came to save his people from their sins. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it says this. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. We are now going to sing hymn number 145, O Come All Ye Faithful. Miss Maddie Govey in the Ministry of Music. Love incarnate, love divine. Star and angels gave the sign. Bow to babe on bended knee, the Savior of humanity. Unto, unto us a child is born, he shall reign forevermore. No
given for us no God and Son of Man, there before the world began, born to suffer, born to save, born to raise us from the grave. Christ, the everlasting Lord, He shall reign forevermore. No. No. We've seen some of the ingredients that Jesus took from the birth, at his birth. First was the timing, the place, the setting, the announcement, and the name. But you know there's something else. The last part of the ingredients was God of the lowly. As you look back over all the details and plans that God brought together for redemption, the common factor is Christ. Christ identifying with the lowly. He left the glories of heaven to become the helpless baby in a virgin's womb. His birth was in a small, insignificant village, midst of the sights and the smells of a stable. Instead of fine linen and fine sheets, he was wrapped in normal clothing, normal cloth, and lied in a straw manger. That evening. And those who came to acknowledge his birth were a ragtag bunch of shepherds. Even his name was common, but his mission, his mission was extraordinary. Although he was the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he came not to exalt himself, but to live among us and to die for us. The wisdom of God's great plan of redemption can be summed up in one way. In Romans eleven thirty three, it says, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are these judgments and unfamable his ways. The Lord does not do anything haphazardly, my friends. Every plan is carefully 
carried out just at the right time. And the truth is, he has a specific plan for each one of his children. Thanks to the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're now able to turn from a life headed towards death and now turn and embrace eternal life. God has a plan for us. This is what we need to remember, is that eternal life begins now. We no longer have to wonder in the darkness of this world because the great light has come. But there's several things that we need, two things. First of all, we need a relationship with Jesus Christ to accept him within our hearts, to put him in the forefront of everything that we do and everything we say. The second thing is this, to become lowly in the heart and humble ourselves in submission to him. That's the only way to see his purpose for our lives to be fulfilled. That means true life begins, begins in God. And is sustained by him, never ending, but stretching out forever and ever in all eternity. I don't know about you this evening. I can't think of a better story than that. That Jesus Christ came into the world in the form of a baby. God placed his hand upon the face of the earth. And all the ingredients that were needed for him to do that were laid out that evening. But all the plans for the rest of the world, he has in his hands. That he has a plan for your life. That he wants you to come into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And this evening, if you don't know him as Lord and Savior, we encourage you to open your heart up and accept him as your Savior. To experience the light of God maybe in a way you've never experienced him before. You know, the light that we're going to light our candles with this evening is called the Christ candle. We take a single light, a single candle, and we light, the, we light off the Christ candle. But, you know, before you light this, this candle was just a candle. No matter how dark in here, if it's not lit it'll still be dark. But as the candle is lit, it illuminates the darkness of this world. And we experience something. And what we experience in this world by accepting Jesus, accepting Jesus and let our light shine, is that the rest of the world will see our light. They'll see the love of Christ in our hearts. That they'll see something upon our face and within our hearts that represents not ourselves, but represents Christ. This evening in closing, as these candles are lit, we encourage you to stand with us. And if you're watching at home, we encourage you to sing with us as we sing Silent Night, Holy Night.
light shine so the world will see it. few seconds you're going to take it and you're going to blow this candle out and the darkness is going to surround my prayer is for you and encourage you don't let the world blow your candle out that you have for Jesus Christ let it shine for in this world around us right now the world needs to see the light that we have for Christ in every way Sue and I would like to wish you all a very Merry Christmas from our house to yours. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for this Christmas Eve, dear Lord. We come to celebrate and just rejoice. Bless us and be with us. And don't let the world blow our candles out, Lord. Let them shine forever. Father, we thank you. And Father, we ask everything in your name. Amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Lee Klein, sitting here with my lovely wife, Sue. You know, we would just like to take a minute and wish all of you a Merry Christmas. You know, Christmas looks a lot different this year. The way we were meeting on Christmas Eve, meeting with our families on Christmas Day. But you know, Christ is the center of everything we believe in. He's the, he's the center of Christmas. It's a birthday of, of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So during this Christmas season, don't take Christ out of the middle of Christmas. Make him the focus point and the center of your Christmas season. So Sue and I would like to take a moment and just say to you, Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas.